Gitco News special coverage of Bitcoin 2023 is brought to you by Coin Payments. Crypto payments made easy. Welcome back to Kitco News coverage of Bitcoin 2023 in Miami. And it is now my pleasure and honor to be joined by Republican presidential candidate for 2024, none other than Vivek Ramaswamy. Very good to have you with us. It's good to see you. How are you? A good spontaneous surprise. Yeah, well, look, that's how I like to, you know, like to roll that way. It's better when it's not too prepared. We weren't expecting it, but we definitely have tons of topics that our viewers are going to be interested in learning about in this interview. So let's start off with a speech that you just made. And you said that the focus on your campaign is going to be reforming the Federal Reserve and making this election about sound money. How do you plan on doing it? It's a referendum on sound money in the Federal Reserve. That's what I said in the Wall Street Journal a few weeks ago, and I reemphasized that on the stage today. The big problem in the country right now is we're going through economic stagnation in terms of growth. We used to grow at over 4% GDP growth. Now it's less than 1%, less than 1 point something percent GDP growth. Big part of the reason why is the Federal Reserve. It's trying to play financial god, hitting two targets with one arrow, inflation and unemployment. It misses both. So what I've said is I would put the Fed back in its place to have a single mandate. Focus on stabilizing the U.S. dollar as a unit of measurement, period, rather than trying to focus on multiple other mandates. And in the name of smoothing out the business cycle, the Federal Reserve has actually contributed to worsening existing financial, the existing business cycles, creating boom-bust bailout cycles instead. Now, I think that in order to put the Federal Reserve in its place, part of what we need is competition with the dollar itself. That's where Bitcoin and others come in. But I do think it's pretty important to understand the root cause of our economic malady, the root cause of many of the financial crises that we face, is indeed the Federal Reserve itself. All right, so you would remove uh, the unemployment mandate from the Federal Reserve. That's correct. And have it focus on the dollar. Yes. You mentioned in your speech that you would want to see the dollar again backed by a basket of commodities. That's correct. So so we were on a gold standard until the early 1970s. We had over 4 plus percent GDP growth during that period. We had over 3 plus percent GDP growth, close to 4 percent, from much of 1980 even to the year 2000 because at least you had a Federal Reserve that was mainly focused on stabilizing the dollar. But in the late 1990s, when the Fed started to take on more aggressively this idea of playing financial god, buying into the Phillips curve and so on, that's when you actually saw a lot of the economic stagnation. And a Fed that's also hostile to wage growth in America. So anytime wages go up, they automatically tighten monetary policy, which is a big part of the reason why the bottom 99% has not gotten ahead in this country over the course of the last 20 years. So I think the right answer is not necessarily to go back to the gold standard, but more precisely to go to a gold-like standard, which is a basket of commodities that include farm commodities, gold, silver, nickel, et cetera, but a wide basket of commodities that prevent the dollar itself from being volatile, but also actually holds up the integrity of the dollar itself. That would mean that the ability of the Fed to print would be curtailed. That's That's why we got off the gold standard in the first place, because Nixon wanted to allow the country to be able to print more money. Do you think that there would be cooperation with something like that, that essentially takes away the ability to print, print, print? I mean, we're seeing gridlock when it comes to raising the debt ceiling. Mm -hmm. Imagine the kind of gridlock you would face and resistance when it comes to curtailing the U.S. Federal Reserve's and and, uh, Congress's ability to print money. Well, the thing I would say now is this, at least we have have going for us, is this should not be a partisan issue. It is not inherently a partisan issue. Not a Republican issue, a Democrat issue. I think Republicans generally do care about economic growth, at least we have for most of our history as a party. They don't talk about it much anymore. I'm bringing it to the fore. Democrats, for their part, talk a lot about economic inequality and wage stagnation. The Federal Reserve is directly responsible for real wage stagnation in this country because they're hostile to wage increases whenever wages go up. They treat that as a leading indicator of inflation. As a side note, it's actually a trailing indicator of a business cycle, when in fact that means they tighten monetary policy into an already existing downturn in the business cycle that contributes to actually creating a bust, worsening the business cycle in the name of helping it. So I think there's something in it for both Republicans and Democrats. I think the key is actually explaining that, understanding why Democrats want more economic mobility for the 99%. Great, getting the Federal Reserve out of the way is a big part of achieving that goal. Republicans want economic growth. 
Well, if the dollar is stable, you actually have greater economic growth because dollars track capital, the capital tracks projects more effectively and more efficiently when the dollar isn't wildly fluctuating. So I'm optimistic that there's enough in this of common cause such that this doesn't have to be a Democrat versus Republican issue. I also think there's things the president can do even without Congress. So yes, we would need formally to change back to a single mandate. We're gonna need congressional action. But part of what the president does with the chairman of the US Federal Reserve is we have the removal power. So I'll take over in January of 2025. By 2026, we have an appointment power for who occupies the seat of that US Federal Reserve. My view is it should be somebody who shares my perspective here in the tradition of former Vice Chairman Manley Johnson. Pick the right person. That's another way the president, without asking Congress, can actually help reform the Fed. But what would involve getting the dollar backed by a basket of commodities? What would it involve? Yeah. Yeah, it's actually pretty simple. Just like when we had a gold standard, you have the Federal Reserve's ability to either buy back or, or sell dollars in a manner that ties it to what that basket is, a very narrow band that reduces the volatility to no more than what that basket of commodities is volatile at as well. And if it's a diversified enough basket of commodities, that would not be a volatile dollar. Well, this links to the idea of what we're seeing the BRICS countries potentially mm -hmm. develop and this idea of de-dollarization because the dollar has come under attack yep. of both by the idea of this BRICS currency, which is Brazil, Russia, India, and mm -hmm. China, and South Africa looking to form a new global reserve asset, potentially backed by a basket of commodities. I think we should lead the way. They're, they're, they're meeting in Durban, yep. uh, in South Africa this summer, to try and finalize or formalize that conversation. We've also got the, the dollar threatened after the weaponization of the dollar following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We're seeing a number of countries opt out of using the dollar and conduct trade in their own currencies, an increasing trend there. And we're also seeing the petrodollar right. looking on somewhat shaky ground with China and Saudi Arabia forming better and better relations. And of course, Saudi Arabia saying that it's open to accepting uh, potentially other currencies for oil, and we're seeing India uh, buying oil in c currencies that aren't the dollar, the ruble and uh, the, uh, the dirham from the United Arab Emirates. So th the dollar is facing a number of threats right now. Mm -hmm. As president, how would you handle that? Well, I think that that's a major problem. I think a big part of the reason why is that we've abandoned stability of the dollar itself. You use the correct word, weaponization. We've seen the weaponization of the dollar in our monetary system to achieve political and geopolitical goals that should be achieved in other ways, not by actually using the dollar as the mechanism of enforcement. China might do that with the yuan. That's not what we are supposed to be doing with the U.S. dollar. Again, I think putting the Federal Reserve back in its place, make it a clerical function that stabilizes the U.S. dollar, that's how you actually fix that problem, restore trust back. Look, there's no way around it. In the meantime, this is a setback. I think that there is, I'm sad to say it, but for understandable reasons, skepticism of the lasting strong position of the dollar itself. But I think, but I think we can reverse that. This is still relatively short run. January 2025, is that not, far, not that far away? And if you have a president, I'm running to be that president who actually restores the integrity of the dollar, restores the stability of the dollar. It will still be the unit. I think it will still remain the world's reserve currency, even if we have a temporary blip between late 2023 and January 2025, that hopefully causes more Americans to actually see the nature of that problem. So if I'm going to put an optimistic spit on it, it's actually addressing your last question of how would you achieve the political consensus to accomplish this? Well, I think the fact that these new developments are staring us plainly in the face, that hopefully will be enough to wake up Democrats and Republicans alike to say that we need to do something about it and put the Fed back in its place. And one of your first steps would be um, on the side of the dollar to try and get it backed by a basket of commodities like, like the BRICS are looking at doing. That's correct. Okay. And, and, and in order to do that, you have to fire over 90% of the staff at the Federal Reserve. That will stand in your way of doing it. Valid point. Yep. Um, we are, of course, at a Bitcoin conference. Yes. And Bitcoin is seen as the solution to fiat, as the solution to fiat debasement and devaluation and all of the issues that you bring up. And Bitcoiners would argue you don't need a Federal Reserve if you have Bitcoin. It doesn't require a central bank. What would you say to that? We're not going to get there in the next two years is the answer. So. I'm not here to just spout off some sort of theory. I'm running to lead this country starting in January 2025. Realistically, with what I can do as the next president, and the role of Bitcoin is really important in that. What we actually need is alternative opt-out systems that holds the feet to the fire 
of the government and the source and the issuer of fiat currency itself, the U.S. dollar. So it's when you're insecure about your own foundation or your value proposition that you try to shut out competition. So I think the role of the government is to get out of the way of Bitcoin. It, should get, it can be a totally parallel system. No special favors, no special punishments. Discussion of excise taxes or whatever on mining specifically for digital assets or Bitcoin, that's an affront. Let it operate in a way that actually creates a laboratory for innovation, a laboratory that we learn from, but also one that holds the dollar's feet to the fire. I think that's actually a good thing and will put me in a better position as the U.S. president to put the Fed back, put the Fed back in its place because there is a backstop. And then listen, let the market decide as it may, but I personally believe that the right answer is to restore the dollar as a unit of measurement and not have this level of psychological insecurity about the rise of Bitcoin. To the contrary, self-confidence in the U.S. government, if the U.S. government is actually to reflect self-confidence, it would be by actually allowing a parallel system of currency to thrive. But as president of the United States, your focus would be maintaining the supremacy of the U.S. dollar, one would think. Yes. So Bitcoin does pose a challenge to that, but you're saying you would intentionally welcome that challenge in order to give you the leeway yeah. to push to strengthen the dollar. That's exactly right. I think that but, competition makes you stronger. But the end game is to have the dollar as the top currency or maintaining its status rather than moving to a Bitcoin standard. Well, the, the, the reality is in a global economy, everyone has their role to play. So the president of the United States, absolutely. Restoring the stability and integrity of the U.S. dollar is absolutely my focus. But it turns out that competition breeds strength. And so if we're competing against actually Bitcoin as, a, as an alternative currency, that's not something that if we're actually doing things the right way that we should be threatened by or made insecure by, that's something that actually makes us stronger. So that's the vantage point that I bring. Now, what I would say is Bitcoiners are free to continue to, in the free marketplace of ideas and the free market of exchange, free to make their case for why people should be switching over to Bitcoin or, or you know, some people in a different community will make a different case for whatever their chosen unit of measurement is. And that's fine. It's part of what it means to live in a free society. But as the president of the United States, my job is to, A, preserve those freedoms without encroaching on those freedoms through backdoor taxes or modes of regulation that are designed to squeeze out that competition from existence. But even more importantly, to use that as an occasion to strengthen the value proposition of the U.S. dollar itself. Well, we heard uh, from another presidential candidate on the Democratic side, uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. He spoke very specifically about his Bitcoin policy. He would say that he would make sure that the right to hold and use Bitcoin is inviolable and that he would defend the right of self-custody of Bitcoin and other digital assets and make sure that the U.S. remains the global hub of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies and reverse the government's growing hostility towards the industry, paraphrasing him slightly. Yeah. I know he's a Democrat. I'm a Republican. I agree with everything he just said. That, does your, yeah, your Bitcoin, I agree with everything the, he just said. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. My, bit, my Bitcoin policy, for me, if the, the framing's different, the substance is the same. For me, that is all part of my vision of actually taming and putting the Federal Reserve back in its place. And the sooner we do that, the more stable of a dollar we're going to have, but that's actually going to require embracing exactly Bitcoin in the way that, that RFK said, not by pledging to make it, you know, the, the legal tender in the United States or anything like that, but actually by getting the government out of the hair of Bitcoin, which is the direction that things are going right now, is, as he put it, hostility towards Bitcoin that I think actually reflects insecurity of the existing monetary system. One of uh, the big topics of this conference has also been the idea of a CBDC, a central bank digital currency. Mm. I know your answer to that has been, hell no. Yes. And I'm quoting you there. Um, we're in Florida. Governor DeSantis has banned a CBDC in Florida. He hasn't officially declared his candidacy yet, but let's assume he'd be in the race. Yep. Any major economic policy differences that you would have between yourself and DeSantis and Trump? What would be the most glaring sure. differences other than the tackling of the Fed? So, so DeSantis has not yet laid out a specific national economic policy vision, nor has, has it been his job to. He's been a governor, but he hasn't laid one out in a way that's going to be allow me to be in a position to say that here are the exact contrasts. But if I'm going back to his voting record and also Donald Trump's policy record, I think that there's a false debate right now or, or, or a falsely limited debate between tax increases and entitlement and spending reductions. Okay, Democrats argue for tax increases. Ron DeSantis argues for spending cuts. Donald Trump is against those spending cuts. I think it's a false dilemma. There's a third way. 
GDP growth is our mechanism and our path of deliverance out of our problems. Our national debt, yes, is going to be an insurmountable challenge if we're still growing at one point something percent GDP growth. But if we're growing it back over three plus percent GDP growth, most of our fiscal problems melt away because that compounds itself. Nobody in either party is actually talking about it. And so I think it's actually relatively simple, the path to putting us back to three, maybe four, maybe even five plus percent GDP growth. Unshackle U.S. energy. That includes drilling, fracking, burning coal, embracing nuclear energy. That includes further, beyond just unshackling U.S. energy, unshackling the U.S. worker. Right now we're paying people to stay at home reduce those disincentives to work and you actually solve one of the major obstacles that businesses face to grow, finding workers. And the third piece is what we've been talking about all along, reform of the Federal Reserve itself. The analogy I give is if the number of minutes in an hour were to vary, somehow that were volatile, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation. We'd be walking in and out at, you know, at different times. Same goes for the way dollars find projects in an economy. It's not efficient if the dollar is volatile. So those three things alone, I think, restore GDP growth. I think that's the path to deliverance out of most of our problems. And that's really different than not only Trump or DeSantis, but the Democratic Party as well. And it's a big part of why I'm in this race. I'm a pro-growth candidate. And part of that economic growth is grounded in reviving our self-confidence as a country. It's a big part of what we lack. I think that lack of self-confidence manifests itself in all kinds of ways. The hostility to Bitcoin is only one example, one symptom of that deeper loss of self-confidence. And as the first millennial ever to run for president as a Republican, my goal is to help restore that self-confidence for the next generation. A final question, and I know we have to wrap. I know that you said you want to return to the values of America. Yes. That we are drifting away from. Elaborate on that and why you think there's been a pull away from those values and ideals that made America the great country that it is. I mean, the, the values that ground America, meritocracy, the pursuit of excellence free speech and open debate is our mechanism of settling political questions. Self-governance over aristocracy. These are the ideals the nation was founded on. The nation was born on these ideals. I think we're going through a version of adolescence. I think we're a little young, going through our own version of our teen years, figuring out who we're going to be. And when you go through adolescence, you go through an identity crisis. I think that's natural. But I don't think that we have to stay there. I think we're on our way to adulthood. This is what our process of maturation looks like. And I'm optimistic that we'll get through that with conviction on the other side of adolescence on our way to adulthood. And so I'm actually, though I've written a lot about, I think some of the cultural challenges we face today, I'm still optimistic that we're gonna get through and be stronger on the other side of them. I think there's gonna be some very practical things we can do to help liberate us in getting there. And I think reform of the Federal Reserve and restoring economic growth is part of what leads us through the thick of doubt that we're in. And perhaps we need a 37 year old millennial to lead us out of adolescence and back to a mature and hopeful America. Thank you so much, Vivek Ramaswamy. Good luck and appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Cheers. Enjoy the conversation. Cheers. Gitco News special coverage of Bitcoin 2023 is brought to you by Coin Payments. Crypto payments made easy.